Hi everyone, Azrael Knight here, and I want to welcome you to a new series that I've just created, and I'm calling it Pointers, and that's because we're going to take a deep dive into one of the most overlooked types of cameras in the uh, film community, and that's point-and-shoot cameras, and, you know, hence the name Pointers. So this show will look at everything from the simple Holga, you know, where it's basically just a box camera, glorified box camera, all the way to super complicated point-and-shoot cameras, almost basically SLRs with an integrated lens. Not quite bridge models, mind you, but, you know, I, I believe that this show will have an evolution as it goes. This is just the first episode, and I think that it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to exploring the less... Uh, the less popular cameras, and maybe bringing some of the unsung heroes to light. If you go thrifting like me, then you probably see them in secondhand stores all the time, but you pass on them for the most part. I know I have for many years just kind of overlooked them because I haven't had interest, um, neither in my personal shooting nor in my YouTube shooting. Um, but I feel like they're going to pick up in popularity over the next 10 years. I think there's a couple already that are ridiculously overpriced, um, but I think more and more people are recognizing that these cameras are good, and uh, unlike digital cameras which come with a sensor which further locks in that quality, um, you know, it still comes down to, in part, the film that you're shooting, and if you're shooting with a film that you really love and a point-and-shoot camera that you know how to use really well, uh, you can get some fantastic results. I also happen to think that point-and-shoot cameras have advantages that others just don't. Uh, they're completely unassuming, uh, they're very compact, they're easy to take with you and slip in your pocket or wherever, or just hold in your hand as you're walking about. Um, and without all of those manual settings, you can just clear your head and think about subject matter and composition without you know, what aperture or what shutter am I going to use or whatever. It's just <laughs> point and shoot, of course. So like I kind of said already, the goal of this series is to try them out and rate them. Uh, I have a bunch of criteria that I'm going to be basing my ratings on, and I'll let you know that in a few minutes here. And over time, we'll see how they pit against each other. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited about this. And again, part of the reason why I want to do this is because I think cameras like the Yashica T4 and Olympus Mu are 100% overrated. I've owned a couple of Olympus Mu cameras, and I bought them for 10 bucks, and I sold them for like 350 or $400. I've mentioned this on the channel before. And part of the reason why I sold them, of course, was to turn a profit. But the other part of the reason why I sold them is because I tried them and I thought they were garbage. I, I didn't think they were great cameras at all. I mean, I haven't tried the Yushiki T4. I'm speaking only on the Olympus Mu, um, also known as the Stylus. I, I didn't think it was that great. I certainly didn't think it was $400 great. I could have, and I did, put that $400 to much better use. I think there are probably dozens, maybe even hundreds of pointers out there that are better than these aforementioned cameras and I am determined to find them. In this first episode, I'll be taking a look at the Canon PrimaShot, also known as the SureShot Ace, also known as the Autoboy Prisma. Stay tuned. Released in October of 1988, this was the world's first camera with a wireless remote control that detaches, and it also has a waist-level finder which is really strange for a point-and-shoot camera, but was incredibly handy during my test. Let's have a closer look at the camera and its features. Okay, here is my Prima Shot, also known as Autoboy Prisma, also known as SureShot Ace. But in my case, I have a Prima Shot, which I'm pretty sure is the European version, a little strange. I'm just gonna briefly go over all of its features and details here and uh, hopefully I don't miss anything. Uh, first of all, the way that it turns on is with this switch here, and then you're able to fire. That's how it sounds. 
You can see it gives a bit of a red dot here indicating that it's going to fire. So right here is where you see from the waist level up here. Right there, so if I cover up that, it covers up the waist level. And then you can also look through here, and that's looking through here. Kind of a clever design, actually. Uh, of course, here's the flash. Um, I'm pretty sure these two um, sensors here will gauge the distance, so that's for auto-focusing, right? It gives a stereo sort of triangulation, <laughs> whatever that is. I'm sure that's not the technical term. Again, on the top here is the waist level finder, the shutter indication, and the self-timer button, of course, as well as the shutter. Half press to focus, and then press the rest of the way to fire. On the back here, you've got nothing but the film opening. There is a date version, in which case the date would be right on the back here. Um, on the bottom here is something really interesting. This is a tilt feature. So you twist this, and then when you rest the camera, it slightly tilts it upward for when you're doing selfies. Now, this is mainly used when you're using the remote, which I'll show you now. Boom, right here. Isn't that cool? You'll see that it's uh, blinking twice. And then when I press the button here, it blinked quickly and let me know that there was going to be a two second delay before it fired. So you can have this remote idle for about eight minutes before um, it won't work anymore. So you can take the remote off, get everything set up, and you've got about eight minutes before it will stop reacting. Finally, I'll show you the battery compartment. It takes a single 2CR5 battery. Yeah, that is the camera. I think it's a cool, sleek little uh, point-and-shoot camera. A really neat way to uh, kick off this new series. To test the camera primer shot, I went to downtown Calgary. Um, when creating the concept for this series, I realized there was only going to be one film that was appropriate for shooting these uh, budget cameras, these pointers, as I call them, and that's Kodak Gold, uh, specifically Kodak Gold 200. Let's see how I did.
I hope you enjoyed those. Let's talk about the rating system I've devised, and we'll see how the Autoboy Prisma holds up. First off, disclaimer, you should know that the rating system, it comes down to my opinion. A lot of what you're going to see here is subjective. Also, I can only base my findings on the specific camera that I have. So if something seems slow, I can only really be sure it's slow on my camera, and it may not have aged as well as another copy of the same model. For me, everything comes down to five categories. The first category is lens, shutter, and image quality. I'll be basing my score on focal length, maximum aperture, and of course, the results. The rating will be out of a possible 50 points. This is going to make up for half of its total score, because of course, you know, if the image doesn't look great, it doesn't matter if it has all the features in the world, or if it feels great in the hand, you're not going to shoot with it. Category two is metering. Um, because I'll usually have no control over exposure, I'm going to have to rely on the camera's auto metering system and how accurate it is or isn't. And so the rating for that will be out of 20 points. Next up is features. Uh, point and shoot cameras still come with an array of features, even if manual exposure isn't usually one of them. And I think some of these are really important and this score will be out of 15. Category four will be appearance and handling. This one is super simple. How does the camera look? And how does it feel in the hand? As well as performance, of course. Uh, rating is out of 10. And finally, category number five is price. How much is this camera gonna set you back? I'll be basing my score on what the prices are on eBay for recently sold items and sort of the range of the cheapest one I can find to the most expensive, and that rating will be out of five. So how did this camera stack up? Well, in category one, lens, shutter, and image quality, I gave the rating a 30 out of 50. The lens is a fixed focal length, uh, which isn't a big deal. In fact, I love the 35 millimeter focal length. Uh, the shutter was a little slow though. As far as I can tell, the shutter speed tops out at 1 1 25th of a second. This makes shooting from the hip pretty hard, especially when you're using that waist level finder and you don't want to have to stop and shoot, you want to shoot and keep going. Um, according to the Canon Museum website, it shoots at 1 40th of a second when wide open at f3.5 and 1 1 25th when closed down to f32. So most of the score here is awarded to the image quality. I have a few shots here that turned out super nice, and given the right conditions and a steady hand, it looks fantastic. So metering, I gave a score of 13. Uh, metering was hit or miss. Any instance where it was darker in the foreground and lighter in the background, it seemed to gravitate towards the sky for what the overall exposure was gonna be. That means a few of my images ended up backlit. And I made corrections where I could, but of course, um, opening up the shadow means more grain in that area. Uh, if your composition had all even lighting though, it did a really good job. Though I would say that it probably erred on the side of slightly underexposed. For the category of features, I gave it 10 points. And this was a tough one because there were a couple of features that made this a very unique camera and a couple of features lacking that held it back immensely. First problem is that there is no way to turn off the flash, or force it for that matter. So in this attempted selfie where I thought it might go off because I was in a deep shadow, it metered for the sky behind me and it didn't fire. There is also no film rewind feature in case you want to finish your roll early. So you're left with fire the shutter until it reaches the end of the roll. Now the two amazing features, of course, are the waist level finder and the remote. Uh, the remote didn't always react, probably due to its age, but it has a 16 foot range and a two second delay, giving me the option of striking a moody pose like this one. The tilt feature on the bottom helps point the camera up slightly for better composition as well. Appearance and handling, I gave seven points. It's a simple camera and felt pretty natural in the hands. The original strap is comfortable and the waist finder very bright. The shutter does need to be firmly pressed though. There were a couple of times where I thought I fired it and it turned out I just didn't press hard enough. Overall, a sleek and pleasant design that's easy to hold. 
price I rated a three. I only paid three bucks for this camera and I was lucky to find it because they go for about 75 Canadian on eBay. But I saw one go for as high as $185. Um, it was listed as a T4 killer. I don't know if I agree with that or not. I'd have to actually shoot with the T4 to be sure. But uh, it sold, and it sold for 185 plus shipping. So somebody bought um, that title anyway. I also saw some go for 30 to 50 bucks. So keep your eyes peeled, um, because I feel like right now the price of this camera is in a state of flux. It may stay where it's at. It might go through the roof. I really don't know, but uh, make sure you check for the camera under all three of its names. That brings the total score for the Canon SureShot Ace to 63 out of 100. If I had flash control and a center weighted meter with a quicker shutter, it probably would have scored in the 80s. What I'd like to know is, are there other pointers with waist level finders and do they have more features? If you know of one, please let me know in the comments. I'd love to try it. Before I go, I want to mention something a little off topic. A few months ago, I got involved in a print exchange between several other YouTubers, and I got my print a little while ago. Here's some footage of me unboxing it for my patrons. The print I received was from Matt Marosh, who sent me a platinum palladium print, and it's just amazing. It's hanging up in my living room, and I look at it fondly every single day. Matt Marosh does a show called Large Format Fridays, and I would love it if you went over to his channel, gave him a watch, and told him I sent you. Anywho, that's all for now. Please let me know what you think of the series. 100% um, disclosure here, I don't think the YouTube's algorithm is going to be kind because these are really obscure cameras. Definitely not a Leica, not even a Canon AE-1. So if you like this, please take the time to share it. It doesn't matter how many followers you have on Twitter or your blog or whatever, it will boost its viewability if you share it. You can also show your support by joining me on Patreon or making a PayPal donation. Be sure and join my newsletter as well. I do a giveaway each and every month. Links to all of those in the description. And until next time, stay classic. Mm -hmm.